Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Let's pause our series chronology and backtrack to elaborate with a special guest on a topic briefly mentioned in one of our earliest episodes. Pre-Columbian transoceanic contact theories speculate about possible visits to or interactions with North America, the indigenous peoples of the continent, or both by people from other non-American continents at a time prior to Christopher Columbus's first voyage to the Caribbean in 1492. Perhaps the best-known theory involves a Chinese fleet arriving in North America in 1421. Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast has graciously agreed to share with us his unique views on this fascinating theory. 1421 was the year of the sixth voyage of Chinese Admiral Zheng He, the final voyage of the Yongle Emperor's reign. All his luck was about to run out. The emperor would pass from the scene in 1424 after a series of bruising and calamitous setbacks. According to the official version of events, the fleet set sail in March of 1421, right after the new Forbidden City was opened in Beijing, then going as far as the Swahili coast, and then they returned to China a little more than three years later in 1424. The Yongle Emperor was dead, and his son, now the Hongxi Emperor, had sent out the call that all ships had to return to China at once. After such a spectacular voyage, you'd think they'd at least get a hero's welcome. But no one was in the mood to talk about these fleets and the exorbitant costs to build the Forbidden City that only stood for a short while before being struck by lightning and burned to the ground. In Gavin Menzies' book, 1421, the year China discovered America, and Gavin Menzies' version of events is that after they finished in Africa, they split up and went on to sail to North and South America, Australia, and the polar extremes in the Arctic and Antarctic. After the fleet resupplied at their base in Malacca, they sailed up the strait to Samudera, and there, according to Gavin Menzies, they split up. Four eunuch admirals led the four fleets, Hongbao, Zhou Man, Zhou Wen, and Yang Qing, there was also a smaller fleet that was commanded by Zheng He. Zheng He took care of sending all the envoys back home, and then he himself headed back to China, arriving in November 1421. As for the three admirals, they finished up whatever business they had and all rendezvoused off the coast of Mozambique at Sofala and headed south towards the Cape of Good Hope and the southern Atlantic Ocean. There, the winds and currents would take them up the west coast of Africa to the Cape Verde Islands, and then they'd travel west, using the same currents that would carry Columbus some 70 years later. There, Menzies says, the admirals split up the fleet. Zhou Wen sailed north, passing through the Caribbean and up the coast of the USA. Hong Bao and Zhou Man went south, sailing down the east coast of South America, past Brazil and Argentina to the Falkland Islands, and then on to Patagonia. Admiral Hong Bao, from there, sailed on to Antarctica and Australia. On the way, no small feat, he discovers the Strait of Magellan before the man himself did in 1520. Furthermore, we are led to believe that when Magellan sailed through the strait, he already had a map that came from the Chinese that allowed him to safely navigate that notorious rough spot in the oceans. And Mr. Menzies scatters all kinds of interesting things throughout his book, such as claims that Spanish ships later on in the 16th century would come upon Chinese wrecks off the Chilean coast and elsewhere, and that a multitude of animals and foods were brought to these faraway places that brought revolutionary changes for the better to all these beneficiaries in North and South America, Australia, and Africa. So Hong Bao makes it through the strait, hangs a louis, sailed west of Tierra del Fuego, past the Shetland Islands, and south towards the Antarctic Circle. And there, in 1422, cartographers and surveyors aboard one of the vessels charted the coast of, well, part of Antarctica. This made it onto the famous Peri Reis map, now located in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul. Well, Gavin Menzies vehemently says Peri Reis got the info about Antarctica from Chinese sources. Others have said that chunk of land depicted in the map ain't Antarctica. 
from Antarctica, Hongbao's fleet sailed north to warmer climes to Australia, and they landed at Bunbury, south of Perth. The Aboriginal Australians supposedly carry stories to this day of these yellow men who once visited there. They went north from Perth into the familiar waters of the Western Ocean, and there they blended in with the hundreds of other vessels involved in the spice trade. And after a long stop in Malacca, they headed home, arriving back in China October 22, 1423. Now, Zhou Man was still sailing in the high seas. As Hong Bao was heading home, Zhou Man, after surveying the west coast of South America, was crossing the Pacific and zeroing in on the east coast of Australia. The fleet sailed three months with the current that took a straight shot across the Pacific and carried them just north of present-day Sydney. And Gavin Menzies said the Chinese were already familiar with Australia and had been there before. The visits by Zhou Man and Hong Bao were merely follow-up missions for more detailed charting of the coast. From Australia, they sailed to New Zealand, stopping on remote Campbell Island first. From there, they sailed back to the Australian coast, past the Great Barrier Reef, and to the north of Australia, surveying everywhere they went. Wherever these ships landed, there was a danger of getting shipwrecked, and Menzies uh, has said many of these vessels were wrecked all over the place, Africa, North America, Australia. And these Chinese sailors lived as castaways and blended into the fabric of their new homelands. This is why, at least Gavin Menzies says, there is plenty of Chinese DNA mixed in with the genes of the local inhabitants, which can be classified as, quote, recently acquired DNA. But geneticists don't know if recently acquired means 15th century or what. Like everything about this book, lots of smoke, no fire. After Joe Mann's fleet had done their work in Australia and New Zealand, they sailed back home. Like Hong Bao's fleet, they still had Chinese goods to offload in the usual haunts in Indonesia and Malaysia. There they abandoned temporarily their explorations and put their traders' hats back on. The cargo holds were then in turn loaded up with spices and they headed back to China. Or did they? Zhou Man made a last-minute decision after passing the Philippines to keep going in a northeasterly direction. For four months, 16,000 miles, Zhou Man's fleet sailed the winds and currents of the Pacific that took them to the coast of Canada and the United States. Menzies mentions a bunch of Chinese wrecks that were found. They even sailed into San Francisco Bay, into San Pablo Bay, and up the Sacramento River where the winds had blown them. There, many Chinese got off and ended up staying and setting up their own colony somewhere near the Russian River that runs through picturesque Sonoma and Mendocino counties. And Gavin Menzies pointed out that by the 1870s, 75% of the farm laborers in that area were of Chinese descent. This Chinese colony from Zhou Man's fleet were the ones who brought rice cultivation to California, today one of the biggest cash crops in the state as well as all the blue and white Ming porcelain that's found in fragments all over the place. The porcelain had always been thought to have come from later visiting Spanish galleons. From there, the current carried them along the California coast. They didn't stop in Claremont. They kept going, passing the Mexican coast, where another Chinese colony was established and where the Chinese brought lacquerware and textile dyeing techniques to the locals there. Then on to Central America and the northwest of South America, to Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. Then back to China, arriving in Nanjing, October 8th, 1423. That was the story of Admirals Hong Bao and Zhou Man. As for Zhou Wen, he sailed across the Atlantic from the Azores, again using the same winds as Columbus, reaching the French Caribbean islands of Dominica and Guadeloupe. Then from there, he sailed on to Puerto Rico and This is where Gavin Menzies points to the Pizzagano map as proof that these particular islands had been visited by Zheng He's fleets. From Puerto Rico, the fleet sailed towards Florida, past the Bimini Islands in the Bahamas, where they ran aground and had to make emergency repairs, building the mysterious underwater Bimini Road, before heading up the Florida coast. There, they sailed north, passing Cape Canaveral, where five and a half centuries later, a Saturn V rocket would blast off into outer space and take three American astronauts to the surface of the moon. They went all the way up the coast, 
sailing into New York Harbor, a century before Verrazano, and then up to Newport, Rhode Island, where a mysterious lighthouse was built that still stands today. Gavin Menzies said there are 28 of these lighthouses or observatories scattered around the world where Zheng He's fleets had once made landfall. Now, one of the claims that Gavin Menzies makes, and he's extremely insistent about this, is that when Verrazano sailed into Narragansett Bay in 1524, he saw locals who were most deaf of Chinese descent. There were Chinese already living in North America when Verrazano landed. And after all his theories were shot down, Menzies always falls back to this one point. If Zheng He's fleets never sailed to the New World, how did all those Chinese get to the Northeast U.S.? Join me again next time as we continue our search for the first non-Indigenous explorers to reach North America in this special Backtrack miniseries. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you enjoyed this episode.